party for uh, Jacobin issue 25, as well as uh, the main topic of conversation tonight, uh, Catalyst, the journal Catalyst, issue one. I'm Micah Utrecht. I'm an associate editor at Jacobin. Uh, and I work here in the Chicago office. Um, we're here in the In These Times magazine office, so first of all, uh, shout out to In These Times. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with them, they are a progressive magazine that covers uh, people's movements, particularly the labor movement. Uh, you can get uh, free copies of back issues of In These Times uh, by the door uh, when you came in here. Um, and uh, before we start, just a couple uh, announcements. So, as you probably figured out, uh, there's copies of both uh, Catalyst and the new issue of Jacobin, uh, as well as uh, back issues and books and all that stuff in the back, as well as uh, beer and wine if you want some uh, for sale. Arl Stevens, who's also an editor at Jacobin, is back there. I would have him wave his hand, but there's so many people there you probably can't see him. He's kind of he's a short guy, so you can't really see him. Uh, uh, but yeah, feel free to go uh, get uh, drinks and stuff as, as we're talking. Um, tomorrow we have a Jacobin uh, reading group that's here in Chicago that meets here in this office. Uh, and we're actually meeting tomorrow to discuss one of the chapters that is in our book, The ABCs of Socialism, which you can get for just $5, the low, low price of $5 uh, from uh, RL back there. And uh, if you have questions about that, Sean, raise your hand, talk to Sean. Sean is one of the coordinators of the group. Uh, they'll be discussing uh, war and imperialism and uh, whether socialists should be pacifists tomorrow, right? So they'll be right here. Um, also, a week from tonight, we are co-sponsoring an event with uh, the author China Mieville, who uh, just wrote a new book that just came out called October on the Russian Revolution. I read it, it's a great book. Uh, that event is a week from tonight uh, at the uh, U University Church Chicago in Hyde Park, which is at 5655 South University. Uh, so you can find the info for that online if you're uh, interested in, in uh, such a thing. So, uh, very happy tonight to uh, have folks uh, from both from in town and out of town uh, here for this event. Uh, I'll do a round of introductions. So first we have Robert Brenner on the farm who's come uh, visiting us from Los Angeles. He is a co-editor of Catalyst, uh, as well as Professor Emeritus of History at UCLA and the director of the Center for Social Theory and Commun uh, Comparative History, the author of several books, uh, The Boom and the Bubble, The U.S. and the World Economy, and The Econ Economics of Global Turbulence. He's also a member of uh, Graduate Students United, uh, which is in the news this week, right? Uh, NLRB hearings this week. Uh, I saw the, the, the union lawyer for the University of Chicago said something about how, like, lab assistants don't... It's like the majority of their, like, in the sciences, their experiments fail anyway. So, like, it's not even real work, right? It seems like something that, like, Donald Trump would say, but apparently your university's lawyer said it. Um, and Trish writes for a uh, number of publications, uh, including many pieces for Jacobin. Um, so we'll be mostly discussing uh, Catalyst tonight. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I think I forgot to mention that the new issue of Jacobin uh, is about, uh, it's called uh, By Taking Power, and it's about uh, the rise and fall of the pink tide in Latin America. So we won't be discussing that, but um, please, uh, please get a copy of it. So um, we'll start with uh, Bob. Bob, when I've told lots of people about this journal, people are very confused. They're like, well, why do you need another journal? You had to have a second journal, a first <laughs> journal. Like, what makes, could, couldn't we just do the one we already have? Why do we need <laughs> a new journal? Uh, so maybe could you just start off with a brief uh, explanation of the thinking behind Catalyst and, and, and why, why it exists? Uh, as the, in the opening advertisement for uh, Catalyst, the answer is clearly no. I mean, why we need another journal in general at this point, uh, duh, I, I don't think I can give a good account of that in general. A um, ringing endorsement for you to go <laughs> <laughs> But you should read the editorial. So, I mean, in a sense, uh, I think probably the best way to talk about it is, is uh, in a way, or at least to start talking about it, is in a way that, um, uh, 
attributes less to us and our intent than to the immediate period. It's not that we created the period, probably we're not fully responsible for the awfulness out, out there right now. But um, we do think the situation has created a, a kind of opening uh, for the left of a sort that hasn't been present really at best since the 60s, and even then it was of such a different nature because you had an economy and a society that on the one hand, a dynamic economy, and uh, on, on the other hand, a society and a ruling class that was very confident of, uh, of the way forward. So um, what the, this, uh, to try to get a little at the specificity of the journal, which is not easy, but I, because there are other journals, of course, which, like us, are, tr are focusing on uh, conceptualizing what is going on politically in this period. We, what we are concerned about, though, what, we're, what we think will give us a kind of discipline that may not be available to all the journals, because, precisely because they don't have the, precisely this orientation. Our orientation is to political intervention, political activity. We're, we're above all a journal that is about developing political strategy uh, for the left for this period. And so the kind of uh, theoretical and conceptual questions to, uh, that we're trying to pose are guided but with, by what uh, seem to us or what are imposing, uh, or what is imposed on us as the primary political, you know, whether the primary political task. So just to be a little bit more concrete about that, and, and I, you know, probably it's not a bad idea to refer to to, our edit, to the opening editorial because in that uh, we tr we do try to produce an exempt exemplary uh, article for the sort of journal we want to be. And what this is a, this about is trying to. Uh, specify in a fairly precise way what's the nature of our moment. And uh, I can't, obviously, this is the place that goes through the whole ar argument, but as I said, the outcome is the existence of a, of a kind of openings for the left that we, ha we haven't seen in a long time. And why is that the case? The, wh what we, we try to lay out there in a very kind of concrete and specific way is an explication of why and how this capitalist economy has done ever worse and has performed actually really catastrophically for s several decades. It has, it's just the worst period for the capitalist economy since the Great Depression by far. And what this has meant, this is not something that capitalists have welcomed, obviously. What it has meant is that you have this, um, this very slowly decreasing, uh, increasing economic pie. So even if the ca if capitalists are able to maintain their position as before, maintain their strength as before, it's not enough. Because if you, you're looking at practically the disappearance, for example, in the last decade of, of productivity growth in the United States is really, trivial. So what has happened is on the one hand, this long period of terrible uh, terrible economic performance. This is accompanied by a long period of terrible living standards for people. And uh, But up against this, there has been a transformation in actually how capitalism works. And what has become, what is the transformation that is central is a turn by the top essentially top layer of the elite, top layer of actually, on the one hand, corporations, non-financial and financial on the one hand. On the other hand, and this is what partly what's new, the leaders of political parties and especially the Democratic Party and the social democratic parties around the world. So you have an emergent alliance which is directly about solving the political problem that exists for capital as a whole, 
by organizing ways in which there is direct political redistribution upward to capital, and in which there, the state, or, the, or political parties, as it were, reproduce and maintain the privileges of different pieces of the um, capitalist class, especially, especially in finance. So you have a, a coming together, on the one hand, say, of uh, a Democratic Party, which could not survive um, against the Republicans' capitalism in the after Reagan in the in the uh, 80s, and make it coming to move ever closer to top corporations and tech, uh, top corporations and finance, so that privileges are specifically granted to make it easy to make profits. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the 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 uh, the top corporations, the top financiers, uh, are involved in funding uh, and the supporting the political parties to an you know an unprecedented extent. So this happened initially, actually under Reagan, where you had these tax cuts and you know a stock market uh, driven up for for, for capitalists. And on the other hand. You have a, a situation where um, ultimately the, the, the uh, political parties, and particularly the Democrats, organize a series of institutional arrangements to make sure that the top layer can go through them. Obviously, here, top layer in finance um, is rewarded in, incredibly. So people know that you know the top one percent of the elite, the, uh, top half of one percent, top one tenth of one percent, have now. Taken, you know, from maybe eight percent of the total uh, income, they they now have about twenty-two or twenty-three percent. This has all taken place since nineteen eighty by a process essentially of uh, ripoff and, and shift. So why I why I you know linger on this for a second is because if you see that the economy is not providing anything for anyone, people here. Anybody who lives in this country practically knows this just by living their day-to-day -day experience. But so if you, you you look and you see, okay, for various reasons, we talked about the global overcapacity, various reasons profit, prof, making profits is hard, investing uh, successfully is hard. So in, in effect, you have the, the parties insuring by uh, political means, redistribution upward, and, and so forth. What this has meant, since pi is not growing, since you now have a political system which is very narrowly oriented to uh, essentially nurturing this top layer, uh, you have a stunningly unresponsive capitalist class across the board, A, which has, I mean, we watched the election in which you know first uh, you know Sanders challenges uh, uh, Clinton from a kind of the New Deal uh, pr perspective, and uh, um, and then uh, you have of course Trump and his uh, whatever it was populist uh, 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 attack. But the upshot was that the Democrats, from that point, because they are so tied in to this leading layer of finance so tied into political redistribution rather than seem to say, as they tried in the 60s, for example, to try to get capital investment growth and, uh, and trickle down actually to workers. That's not what it's about. It's all about uh, redistribution. So, and, and it's all about, therefore, connections to this top elite. And they're unable because of the economic constraints and the political deal, they're not able effectively to give pe working people or most of the population anything. So you have this kind of weird phenomenon in both the primaries and in the election of Hillary Clinton running and refusing to do what the Democratic Party always you know, thought it should do. I mean, would do, which is to, you know, provide better services, you know, better, you know, welfare, etc. They no longer even pretend to do this. She 
wouldn't even propose, you know, support raising the uh, minimum raise from 15, from 12 to 15. She wouldn't support single payer. Uh, she wouldn't really disavow the trade deals. In other words, she stuck in a hard line way, in this kind of surprising way, to the neoliberal politics that cannot possibly appeal to the larger numbers of people. And she lost the election, obviously. And then since the election, we've seen they've gone ever further to, you know, to excommunicate Sanders and move the, and continue to move the political party to a, a social base that is appropriate to their alliance with the top elite. That, and that is basically suburban, uh, well-off uh, well uh, voters who are now, hopefully, they can move them from the Republican Party. So they, uh, they are not even looking at the millions that supported Sanders. They're not looking at the millions who supported Trump and were now going to, to be disappointed. All of which is to say that we have so I was trying to, in my long-winded way, trying to talk about our attempt to provide a, con a conceptual understanding of how the world is working to provide a strategic uh, a, a account of what is to be done. And so what the result of, of this is to open up this huge field of where uh, of politics, which speaks to people's needs, which is not being even touched by Democrats, not being touched by Republicans. So if you want to put it in general, what, we, what we're at a point now is where we have what's very clear that needs to be done, which is build new political organizations, build actual institutions that can fill this vacuum, uh, get in a condition where everything favors us in that respect, but what does not favor us is the historical legacy of institutions of the left. And everybody knows how weak the labor movement is, how weak you know, the black movement is, how weak the women's movement is. All these movements are, should have a moment to, to, to return. But we've always depended on industrial working class that we can know that is no longer there to provide the fundamental organization for the left. And so this is the vast area that has opened up where we have to begin to develop a strategy in a context where the ruling class is not trying to buy anyone off. The ruling class is not really trying to convince anyone of the glories of capitalism. The ruling class is making very clear, though, to frighten and intimidate people who dare to organize, as we saw uh, the, the, the great liberal Obama dispersing uh, the Occupy across the country in a very systematic you know, and, and, and rude away. So I just want to, so the, I'm, I'm talking in this way to kind of instantiate or give an idea of what we want to do, which is really, and that's sorry, I tried to pose it at, at the broadest level and maybe too vaguely, but trying to propose, if you do a serious analysis of this period, again, economy can't grow, there's a, a ruling class dependent on political ripoff, not concerned to provide anything to population, a capitalist class that will allow any political party to deviate from that neoliberal <coughs> position where they have a great opportunity with great opening. And we need, one thing we need is a journal that, I mean, it's a trivial aspect of what we need in big time, but hopefully we can contribute to the process of reorganizing working people to be able to fight back. And that's essentially how we, we see ourselves, focusing on strategy. Strategy is, I, I think, it's always talked about, not things are rarely actually done about it. And so we hope to <laughs> be able to reverse it. We have the pretension of trying to do it because we think the period is so much more favorable than, than ever before. And so we look forward to collaborating with all sorts of people to begin to develop the, those analyses and then what is to be done. Is Greece and Spain and, and so forth that we had the big French uh, strikes which brought collaboration between workers and students and, and neighbors. So it's actually, 
the kind of unification that we, we, we've been searching for. And, um, and of course, uh, this country occupies so on. But what has been striking are two things about this, which I, I, I see as absolutely central uh, about this. On the one hand, they have absolutely failed politically. I mean, it is a stunning how it is stunning how difficult they have found it, or whether they have actually posed the problem of how, say, coming out of the French strikes, which really were kind of a high point and really did instantiate kind of alliances we've been looking for for the longest time. But the they the French uh, strikes end, and there's nothing left. There's no fallout political fallout where people are taking lessons, making an organization, finding a way to be able to uh, attract people who want to continue to be militants and new people who are coming in. That, that has not been able to be done. Either way, how do we break beyond this democrat, social democratic stranglehold which is stopped, which is actually serve to stop revolution or, or radicalization in a place like Greece, where there was a gigantic upsurge, and in, but where in which the, the left was not able to break with the hard social democratic core of Syriza. The whole group wasn't social democratic, but its leadership was. And so it's that layer that still, we have to admit, remains hegemonic until we can replace it. Everybody's trying to skip by these groups. Unfortunately, we can't bypass them. We have to defeat them. Uh, speaking of the recent upsurges that we've seen lately, uh, one of those upsurges is surely in the uh, 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 radical black movement in this country, Black Lives Matter and the City Black Youth Project, whole list of different groups, um, which is part of the, the, the subject of your article, Cedric, um, uh, The Panthers Can't Save Us Now. And uh, it's a very provocative essay. Uh, you offer some critiques uh, uh, of, the, of the contemporary uh, radical black movement uh, that you you tie to, you essentially say that uh, some of the, these groups are, are making some of the same mistakes that were made uh, by the kind of first wave of, of black power and black radicalism in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, so uh, can, you, can you briefly just lay out uh, that argument, the, the sort of uh, what you see as the, the problem between, uh, the, what you see as the link between black power of the, of the sort of new left era versus the black radicalism today and what, what those issues are? I, uh, so what I'll, I'll start by saying before I get into the, the question, I just want to thank Bob and uh, Vivek for inviting me into this project. I was really excited to be a part of it from the very beginning and kind of fell into it um, unexpectedly. I also want to evoke the name of uh, Judith Stein, the historian who recently passed away uh, after, I think, a few bouts with, with cancer. Um, if you haven't read her uh, trilogy of books, uh, the first one on Marcus Garvey, the second one on, on the steel industry during the post-war period and the process of deindustrialization, and then her uh, most recent book, which was on um, the 1970s, in the beginning of this process of neoliberalization, right, during the Carter years. If you haven't read those, you owe it to yourself. You definitely need to take a look at those works because I think she does the study of uh, American history and when she turns to the question of, of black life, she does it in a way in which it should be done, right? So um, part of what I was trying to do in this, this essay was to take on some of the rhetoric that I've heard over the past couple years going back to the, uh, the Trayvon Martin killing and the way in which a lot of people have seized upon um, certain aspects of uh, black power rhetoric and even some strategy without really reflecting on what we might learn from, I don't want to say failures, but limitations of that particular period. And so one of the main things that I try to tackle is the notion of politics, like what actually constitutes political life and uh, how, do, how should we think about interests uh, in politics. One of the main problems we always run up against uh, in talking about African American politics is this view that somehow blacks constitute a coherent or cohesive constituency, right? So people talk about 
African Americans as a constituency, where they see uh, racial identity and constituency as synonymous, and they're not, right? And so for most of my, my uh, academic life, intellectual life, going back even, even uh, further, I've been concerned with trying to attack that, right, and really try to push back against this idea that somehow uh, we should talk about black life in those really simplistic terms. And Can you explain maybe my, what those, those breakdowns are, what the, the sure, sure. yeah, that it's not a monolith or X, Y, Z? Yeah, and people always say that, right? So you always hear people give that caveat, you know, the black population is not a monolith, but then they proceed to talk about black people in monolithic terms, right? And we even see this among folks on the left, right? I mean, there's some categories that people use. Um, even you all just use the black movement. I wouldn't use that, right? Just like I don't use the black freedom struggle as a, as a construct. Because, again, you, you begin to reduce a complex set of interests, different ideologies, different temporal positions that people are taking within black populations across the country. Um, you reduce those to something that's easily understandable and, and relatively coherent. Let me give you a quick comparison, right? Um, when we think about the black population in the United States, it is larger than the population of the entire continent of Australia, right? And we can even add, and that's not just Australia proper, but you know, East Timor, New Guinea, all these other places that are part. We can even add New Zealand to the mix. And we still have them beat as far as population. But nobody talks about all of those different uh, national groups with the level of simplicity that we hear whenever black, the black population comes up. If you think about the country of Greece, there are four times as many African Americans as there are people in Greece, right? But again, we don't really hear the same sophistication, right? We go back to these you know, really convenient um, place markers and ways of talking about black political life that I think are reductionist, right? So part of what I've been doing, and it's not solo, I've been doing this in concert with a number of other people, um, is to try to think about uh, a class analysis of black life that makes sense, right? And that's really helpful, and really gets at the heart of what we would call sort of actually existing black political life. So again, they're different political interests, and they're constantly shifting um, on any given issue. Like if we're talking about school reform, just in this city, you find blacks on both sides of the issue, right? If we're talking about um, you know, any labor struggle on any campus or any, uh, in any workplace, sometimes you'll find black people on both sides of the issue. So where's the black interest in that? When you listen to some of the rhetoric of um, Black Lives Matter activists, there's a tendency to talk about police violence as though it's a black thing. Right? We know that blacks are totally overrepresented in the numbers of folks who are killed by police. But when we look closely at the numbers, you know, just for the last two years or even going back for two decades, um, typically, in most years, blacks are the minority of people who are being killed by the police nationwide. And I say that not to make an all lives matter type of, of uh, you know, comment, but just simply to say if we're serious about building power, if we're serious about organizing in a way that will be effective, then we have to think about the actual scenario that's playing out. What are, the, what are the facts of it? And what kinds of constituencies can be brought into um, you know, common cause? One thing I'll say, and I'm willing to jump out here and say this now, it's not in the essay, but I'll say it now. I actually think that the policing crisis that we've witnessed over the past couple of years is over at this point. I think it reached an impasse last summer. You all remember that week, uh, 4th of July week, where you had, um, you know, you had the, the Micah Xavier Johnson police killings in, where he killed police officers in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And then you also had Eugene Long in Baton Rouge who killed police officers. During that same week, right, we know Philando Castile and Alton Sterling were killed, right, by police. That same week, you had 10 people overall, nationwide, who were killed by, by police. Of that 10, um, three of them were African Americans. One was white, and the remaining uh, were Latinos, right? But that didn't really get pulled in to a lot of the conversations that I was a part of, right? You had to really force people to talk about it in those broad terms. And if we really think seriously about the last couple of years, I mean, what, what have we gained from all of the popular demonstrations? And I was at some of these demonstrations. I've been in, in you know, vigils. I've been involved in a lot of different things that have happened. So I'm not against the idea that we should fight it in those ways. But over and over again, we've seen uh, acquittals of officers, we've seen officers not even brought up on charges. Um, we've also 
witness things here in this city where, um, you know, we've got a, a, a mayor who went, who did an end run around the more democratic process of selecting the next, the next uh, police superintendent to pick his own guy, right? And we've also saw the weakening of um, protections that might, you know, um, allow for citizens to not be brutalized or potentially killed by police officers. We've seen that here, we've seen it in Texas, and in other places. So the question we need to ask ourselves is what have we gained and why have we lost continuously in this process despite bringing thousands of people out onto the streets? I think the problem is that it hasn't really, um, these demonstrations haven't really uh, captured a broad enough public. That's one problem, right? That there are people beyond activist circles who are not really engaged, who may be upset when they see these videos, but they're not necessarily uh, willing to do the things that are necessary to, to affect change. The other thing is that I don't know if there's enough seriousness, and I'm willing to take some, some make some broad sweeping statements if this is going to get some conversation going. There's not enough seriousness about um, what politics is all about, right? You know, even if we suspend my criticisms of how people think about black power, you know, just this past year I've heard so many people talk about, um, you know, politics in such simplistic ways, right? You know, that somehow your vote is like an expressive act, and like if I decide not to vote at all, somehow this is important, right? And instead of thinking about elections for what they are, right, they're a momentary uh, act. There's, there's, a, there's a moment when you, can, you might be able to shape the context of, of, of uh, policy making in a really basic way, but it doesn't end there, right? You have to continuously pressure those persons who are elected. And, you know, I was at a, a, a meeting, I won't mention the university, here in the Midwest, where we ended this conference talking to activists. Right? And these were great people. They talked about their, their uh, local uh, struggles and what they wanted to see. And it was all good stuff. Civilian review boards, things we've heard before. Right? We want more restrictions on what police can do, body cameras, you know, the, the usual laundry list. And my question to them was, well, how are you going to get those things? Right? You're in a lily white state, you know, and you want to try to get these things through uh, a Black Lives Matter type vehicle. How are you going to get city council members to support what you're doing? Or legislators, right? Uh, or the mayor, right? Silence, right? Nobody's thinking about those things in that kind, you know, at that moment. They weren't really thinking about those sorts of questions. There are other people who are. That has to be a part of, of what, we, what we're discussing. And I think when we bring in the black power period, there are a lot of important lessons, right? I mean, people elected folks to office during the 1970s and 80s, and they were able to get some gains, right? They were able in some cities, uh, like Oakland, um, Gary, and a few other places, to get some momentary reductions in incidences of police violence um, under these black, you know, regimes. But that was really that was like before the war, the, the war on drugs really took off. So. Um, <coughs> I think there's lessons in that period, right? We need to go back and think seriously about um, what worked and what didn't work. And think seriously about what it means now to, to push for police reform in cities that have, like Baltimore, where you have, you know, black mayor, black, uh, you know, um, politicians in, in, in the city council. You have black officers on the streets. How do you, what is that, you know, how does it matter or should it matter, right? And what can we learn from this earlier period of, of, uh, of reform and, and even retrenchment? The last thing I'll say, and this is, this is kind of circling back to the, the, uh, the title of the piece, um, it might sound like a swipe at the Panthers, it's not. Uh, the one thing I will say critically about the Panthers in, in the essay is that even though we think about them as a model, Right? A lot of people think about them as a model that should be emulated. One question that keeps coming back to me, and I think it's one that we should all consider, is, is the, the extent to which the Panthers themselves were successful as a model of revolution within this American context. Right? So we know that they had mass residence as an organization. You know, thousands of people rallied to their side in terms of legal cases, many people um, 
you know, bought posters and what have you. Um, folks thought that, you know, their persecution by the FBI and COINTELPRO was wrong. But the Panthers were never able to achieve popular power, right, which is something different. Their power stopped at you know, the black communities that they were organizing in some cities. And that will still be inadequate in this particular moment. Right? So it's not enough, even if, even if black people are organized and unified and moving, it's still not enough to change this country. Right? And so I think that's the bigger question uh, for the left at this particular moment. Um, you can't go back to the Panther model because it wasn't enough during that period. It's sure, it's sure not enough at this particular uh, juncture. So I'll stop there. But one of the things that you make an argument for in the in the piece is um, this uh, a kind of re return to a universalist politics, right? Uh, and and then you say that is a problem with both uh, the Black Panther model and new Black radicalism today. Right? So my day-to-day -day experiences as a professor, right? somebody you know, not uh, respecting my work in, a, in an academic context, I may, I may see that as like a racist uh, moment. That's not the same as um, you know, being in a situation where you don't really have the means to sustain yourself. Right? So I think for me, um, you know, there's a need to even parse out what we mean by racism, because at this point, it can mean everything, right? It can mean dirty looks. It can mean, um, you know, systemic uh, denial of, of loans to areas where majority black populations live. It can mean gutting uh, scholarships that go to, um, you know, black or brown kids. So it can mean all sorts of things. And I think, you know, that in and of itself, um, is a problem, right? When I talk about universal policy, I mean, you know, I do so because historically there are other black people who also supported uh, universal uh, social policy, right? And that's, that's one of the things that was missing in the, um, in the Coates exchange. I didn't go back and really try to, try to you know, uh, to emphasize the point. You're talking about your piece in Jacobin about yeah, uh, yeah. the response to Tana Hazy Coates' uh, preparation piece. Right, right. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I think that, that, you know, during the 1930s and 40s, right, you know, it's not like people accepted the, the limits of the New Deal and just, you know, backed off and didn't push for more, right? You know, people like A. Philip Randolph and others um, actively organized to, you know, to extend the New Deal and to address whatever limitations that were in it, right? And I know this is a revelation for folks, for some folks, that there were black people who benefited, right? Whether it was the, the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, whether it was the Works Progress Administration, whether it was desegregation of the defense industry, which allowed for you know, blacks to take on jobs at places like the Kaiser Shipyards in, in the, uh, the Bay Area and other places, right? Um, that there was meaningful, uh, you know, gains that were, were made by, by that particular moment. And even still, even if that was limited, should we think about um, the history of the New Deal as the horizon of contemporary struggles, right? I mean, that's another problem. I mean, should we, should we then begin to say, well, if they couldn't do it in the 1930s or 40s, then we shouldn't try to attempt, you know, some broad-based um, universal, uh, you know, social policy in the present. That's another, I think, interesting problem that I hear in some contemporary uh, rhetoric and discussions about universalism. Uh, Trish, um, to change gears slightly, uh, since the election, we've been hearing the word class more than, more than we've heard in a while in mainstream discussion of politics. Um, Especially since Trump won, though, much of that rhetoric has focused on this very narrow conception uh, of what class means, right? Like, basically, the only time that we hear it in the mainstream media, when we hear class, uh, but also when, we, when many liberals uh, talk about class, is to talk about this, uh, this white working class. 
which is a pretty inaccurate and sloppy way of like only talking about a pretty narrow slice of that demographic itself, right? Uh, but you, your recent scholarship has uh, been a kind of uh, rebuke to that narrow conception of class. So um, can you talk a little bit about what's wrong with the way that class is being discussed uh, in, in American politics right now? Sure. So I think the, the concept of a white working class, as, as it's thought about today, right? obviously the white working class exists, but the way the white working class has been used, particularly since the election, um, says something to me about uh, the racialization of the working class that is, is not only inaccurate, right, in terms of the changing demographics of the working class in the United States, but it also, I think, makes an incorrect assumption about um, who gets which jobs and why people get the jobs that they have. And so, to me, it portrays a sort of historical amnesia um, about the relationship between a, a specific sort of post-war vision of what white working class living standards for industrial workers specifically um, that these were sort of only the result of racial privilege and rather than allowing for like a, a more full examination of the making and remaking of working class living standards across the last century. Um, and so I think we have to sort of really begin to unpack the ways in which race and rach, racial imagination is functioning in the story. So I, I think it might be useful to actually do this in a way that's not specifically related to the election. Um, Mostly, I think, because I think a lot of us maybe are sick of talking about it a little. Um, but I think, in terms of the things I think about, the, there are two other problems which I think actually give us a really good glimpse into this process. And so that's the, the link between ongoing climate disruption uh, and the remaking of imperial power, specifically from the American standpoint. And so the remaking of the American working class in a way where people um, think that they can imagine what a white working class looks like, that it's particularly, it's male, it's rural, it's um, probably between the age of 35 and 60, um, <laughs> and that it has a particular set of political ideas, um, is also telling us a story about who deserves and who belongs in American society. It's a perception of who's being sacrificed uh, and who is sacrificable to sort of incorporate um, so that the concept of sacrifice zones that an increasing number of climate scholars are using to sort of understand, understand the geographies um, of a climate change world. And in reality, this dualism between the sacrificed and the sacri uh, who's actively being sacrificed and who is considered to be sacrificable uh, is a very false one, that both are being sort of fed into the system at the same time um, through the processes of exploitation and accumulation. So if we think about these in, um, one of the places where I think it's been most prominent is probably the, the struggle over the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and so here we see sort of the typical uh, categories of colonized or uncolonized um, and labor and the environment, right? These two, two dualisms that have structured a lot of politics over the last half of, uh, half of the century. And so the idea of this uh, white racial, racial imagination um, is really ideologically key here to obscuring the deeper story about capital accumulation through the exercise of imperial power, namely through the granting of easements by uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. And so the imagined white workers uh, for the Dakota Access Pipeline, who in this case are majority white, um, but that's sort of a different set of processes than um, the sort of imagined white working class that they, so they simultaneously live in this white racial categorization, but are also imagined to be something they may or may not be, um, really places uh, whiteness not as a category of historical mutability, right, not something that changes over time, but rather something that's essentialized, um, and they become much easier villains in this sense, um, and it also, in the most bizarre ways, makes the, um, the imperial part of the story completely invisible, right? By actually turning one of the empire's oldest tools, the casting of racial differences as, as a natural thing, um, is actually being a way of obscuring the actual imperial accumulation that's happening at the same time. And I think that the invisibility of empire in this process is uh, not an understatement or a mistake. And I think for me this was particularly telling, I was teaching a course on uh, decolonization, and I asked my students before we began reading a bunch of materials on the Dakota Access Pipeline if they thought they lived in an empire. 
and not a single one of them thought that they did. Um, and I think this isn't actually just a statement on them, right? These are people who, like, for example, would have sort of identified with the ideas of the politics of Black Lives Matter, right? So they have this understanding of racial inequities and racial injustice, but not a sense of how to frame them through uh, disparities in state power and questions of sovereignty um, or accumulation and exploitation. Um, and so I think uh, this really becomes a really key way in which to reimagine um, sort of the idea of what race is doing in our discussion of the working class, right? Because I think it's very easy on the one hand to have a sort of very visceral reaction to the idea that there's only one slice of the white working class that we actually talk about, right? Which is really a narrative about decline. It's a narrative about um, the disruption of living standards, increasingly like uh, a huge focus on opioid addiction, right? And so like the actual story that's being talked about is a story that's racialized and we have to talk about the way that race is operating, but to only, uh, we have to understand that the whiteness that's being imagined is constantly changing um, and not something that's sort of essential to the character of white workers in the country, right? That the industrial jobs that are sort of identified now as this marker of racial privilege are actually that way because of unionization struggles that realistically weren't actually that long ago. Um, and so the way that the idea of class has been remade over the course of the 20th century is really immutably tied up with the way where white industrial workers became the white industrial workers we can imagine them to be today. And I think in a lot of ways this actually sort of is an interesting, uh, maybe other side of the coin to part of Cedric's argument, right? Like that this idea of racial essentialization is really key to sort of the continuing of um, different forms of racial injustice uh, in American society today. The, you're, the, on that last point, you're saying not just uh, Cedric's point about uh, essentialized blackness, but also an essentialized whiteness in, in how we're thinking about class. Right, well, I think they, they feed off of each other, right? Because to essentialize blackness is to also essentialize uh, whiteness. And then I think, obviously, one thing that that also has to do is it casts things in black and white, right? And doesn't account for other forms of racial disparity. I think that would actually be something it would interest, be interested to hear that like, Cedric talk more about, right, is like how other sort of struggles um, for racial justice outside of black politics are sort of impacted by like a conceptualization of black struggle that's really fed through black nationalist politics. Because I was really struck by um, sort of reading your article against like Fanon's The Pitfalls of National Consciousness um, as being sort of like a correlating article. Uh, we, we can, yeah, let's, if you want to respond to that, Cedric, or uh, any of the panel, before we turn it over to questions, has anything they want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, actually, you used, I referred to Fanon in uh, the first book that I did. I, 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 uh, I referred to that chapter, right, which is a chapter which isn't always fully uh, appreciated. Um, I think most people read the concern and violence part and then maybe stopped reading uh, after that. But, um, the sexy part. Right. <laughs> what happens after you get power, right? So I think uh, no, nah, I think there's definitely some some um, you know some overlap. One thing I was going to mention, I mean, there is there is a material dimension to the essentializing process, though, right? To the extent that um, after World War II, right, you get uh, you know the the birth of, of suburbia and the expansion of the, the middle class, which is really the working class, to sort of better pay and um, mm -hmm. you know better, better uh, material surroundings, right? But I think, you know, that was totally racialized, right? And I, I mean, um, the person who summed it up best for me is, is uh, Ture Reed, who's a professor at Illinois State, uh, when he said that when you look at the Truman, you know, 1949 Housing Act, it's like, you know, white, I mean, literally, in, in the, the provisions, right? Whites get suburbs, suburban housing, and black people get public housing, right? You know, so, um, you get that spatial makeover of cities, as well as the transformation of the, the uh, you know, objective conditions that most white people are living under um, in ways that has far-reaching consequences, right? You know, into, into the contemporary moment, right? Where people um, really can, can uh, associate whiteness with middle-class, suburban, um, secure, tax-paying, deserving citizenship, right? And, and then on the other side, black people as welfare dependent, 
public housing recipients um, and undeserving, right? So that, that really comes out of the period. One, one thing that just struck me about this, and it, it, this is the, just the evidence of it, right, when you see the, the change. Some of y'all might remember this phrase that was in a lot of movies in the 1930s and 40s, um, you know, where, you know, it'd be a situation, an exchange between two white characters, and one would say, you know, I'm, I'm free white and 21, right, just to sort of assert their authority, right? So this was a constant part of cinema in the 1930s and 40s, but in the post-war period, it really kind of disappears um, as, a, as a central, you know, trope. And I think it disappears because it's no longer needed to, you know, to be asserted, right? Especially among people who are now, uh, you know, they're being free and, and autonomous has been uh, supported and expanded and, you know, underwritten by the federal government. So um, I think, you know, I think there's definitely a lot of overlap. Maybe we should, we should move on. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Bob, you want to? No, I think maybe I'll just uh, ask a question of you, you two uh, on this. Um, I was slightly, uh, I was slightly um, surprised in a way you were talking about suburbanization mm -hmm. and uh, white privilege or white advantage at this moment. I, I didn't use those terms. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 I tried to correct myself when I mentioned privilege. I don't know if we can say advantage. I mean, you know, white's doing better. Okay. Um, the, the, but the question I would ask is what. Had, what, how do we evaluate the, for politics and for political strategy, the devastation of the working class as a whole, including uh, and especially white workers? I mean, just, we're not just, you know, if we have a, if we just have a, a census and we just look at all these people, um, you have a situation where you know, you know, just tremendous decline in, in, in living standards. Just as if, as if the working class was only white. Right. Um, you have a, a disastrous decline in working standards, and you have, it is um, today, you know, in, in analyzing something like uh, Occupy, which was way too heavily white and was unable to, unfortunately, get a lot more uh, uh, um, black participation. But even this layer, which has been the kind of classic layer that has made the radicalizations and you know the squares and so on, is always sort of uh, kind of close to college-educated whites, or even getting toward graduate school, and they're look they're looking out and they see no prospects. And we there's been a lot of studies lately which take this far beyond that point showing that basically since 2000, there are virtually no jobs being created for you know, a catastrophic wipeout. Uh, I mean, we know there's a terrible housing crisis and that it involves everybody, but blacks, uh, blacks' wealth has just been completely decimated. They've almost all their all the housing wealth is is gone. So I guess what I ask you two guys is, what do we? What political implications do we take from a period in which true whites are, on average, you know, not talking about any subjectivity at all, just objective conditions. Whites are still doing way better than blacks. But whites are doing so badly, so uh, there is so little of a, a quote better off white working class that we used to you know uh, uh, that we used to talk about. There's very very little of it. So how do we how do we um, draw the consequences of that politically? Still divergence, very uh, you know a great deal, but everybody is sort of, you know, going down under the hammer of neoliberalism, and so uh, what, what do we, how do we strategize this, or, ch or change our strategy, or adjust our strategy in that context? Maybe one of you can answer that briefly, and then we'll turn it over to questions. Okay. Who's going to say? So, I mean, two what minutes. I would say, oh, two minutes, two, 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 two minutes, minutes, right? So what I would say, um, 
in, in evoking the post-war transformation, right? Part of the reason why I did that is because I think, you know, suburbanization <laughs> transforms the meanings of, of how people think of class, right, in, in, in that period. Um, and really adds to, um, you know, the continued eliding of, of class within American mm -hmm. culture, right? Because a lot of people don't really see themselves as part of the working class, mm -hmm. right? The other thing I would say as well um, within that, and this might be the place to start, you know, is how do we overturn, you know, um, underclass ideology, right, as a way of explaining inequality within this country, and how do we also, you know, begin to talk about the broad problems that you're, you're discussing versus just emphasizing the situated experiences, right, like I, you know, at a university, public university, when there's certain kinds of pressures. But how do we think about um, the broader class positions that you, you're describing, right? But on this matter of the underclass, right, because I think this is really important, there are a lot of people in the United States, maybe outside of this room, who still believe that they still have a relative chance of success in this country if they work hard and if they play by the rules and what have you. And that's despite all of the, the terrible things that have happened, right? And then when people don't do well, they explain that by, by resorting to underclass notions, right? This idea that, you know, immigrants, black people, other folks who are in poverty or in poverty because they deserve it and because they're not as, as uh, industrious or hardworking and, and um, thrifty as everybody else. That's still pervasive, um, and I think that on the left, right, we haven't really done an effective enough job confronting that in everyday life, right, and really challenging those notions. Um, I was at a I was at a restaurant in Staten Island a few weeks ago with uh, with a friend of mine. I was there to give a talk, and we ended up, you know, we were having a conversation about Black Lives Matter, and the, the owner of the restaurant comes up and he tries to engage us, and he's saying all sorts of reactionary bullshit, right? <laughs> and one of the things he's saying, he keeps, he keeps saying that people shouldn't use the term Black Lives Matter. You know, it's that typical, like, All Lives Matter stuff. He's like, they shouldn't use that slogan, because when you start using that slogan, he's like, I'm not listening to you, right? And at first, I'm like, man, this guy's so ass backwards. I don't really want to have this conversation. I'm glad we already ate, because uh, <laughs> you know, who knows what's going to happen you know, if we really confront him. But it comes out, as we continue to push him, it comes out that his son had been, um, you know, had been struggling with addiction. And he had had his own problems you know, trying to get gainful employment before this, this restaurant thing took off. And so he had the same problems as, as many other people. But he didn't really see himself uh, in the same way that he saw other people who were struggling outside the, the ferry terminal, you know, near where we were. So I think that's a big task for, for us, right, is to really confront that, um, this idea that somehow people who fail in this society have simply been done in by their own bad decisions, right, and their own cultural pathologies. I mean, that's a much older, you know, set of, of uh, of ideas, but they still persist in this moment, right? I mean, there's a lot of that which still goes on. I'm sure you all hear it when you go home and you, you know, you can see people in your hometown. But how do we confront that, right? Because I think overturning that notion that somehow it's individual choices and bad behaviors that, you know, is, is responsible for our conditions um, and not, you know, technological change and, and outsourcing and restructuring and you know, all these other things that happen at the same time. Let's uh, turn it over to any questions, probably do 10, 10 or 15 minutes or so. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Patrick, yeah, I'm Patrick, I'm an activist, 